welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Thank you for joining me. If it's your first time here, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. So if you like crime and consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Also, if you like a lot of detail, I go into a lot of detail. There is a deep dive on cases that you may think you know, but if you listen to my videos, you may know more at the end of them. Take a lot of pride in the amount of research that goes in. And it's not just from Google, it's from a range of sources, including private ones, because I have a lot of access through years of presenting crime shows. So hopefully that will make you want to stay. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you come back here religiously and you don't subscribe, just do it. Then you'll get a notification if you put them on that says I'm releasing new content. Also, all your likes, all your comments, I read. I really appreciate it haven't joined me for a live chat, please do. I tend to be there at the premieres on a Wednesday and Sunday and it's a lovely community. Also, massive shout out, thank you to my Patreon subs because you make it brilliant for me to be able to create more content. Very much appreciated as is every single person who comes here. That said, taking a breath because there's quite a lot of information there. Let's talk about today's crime, which guys, I have had so many messages off you so many about this case and often when a case has been covered on google for example people have done videos and whatever else has come out in the press and i always feel like i want to do it because i always think well you've seen this before and you've heard this before but i relent on this and i've gone ahead and done it anyway so the case that i'm covering today is one that you guys have recommended i do i hope because i know a lot of you will have seen things on it that you genuinely do believe that you get some added value from coming here. It was horrific researching this case, literally. Lots of different reasons why I feel that way that I will come to through this video, but bear in mind, thanks chaps. I appreciate those recommendations when I actually get traumatized doing the research. I digress. Let's get on with today's case. And I'm gonna be honest, this case today fuels really one of the most shocking cases that the English criminal justice system have ever seen. And the period of crimes spanned 30 years, but they all begin in 1987. So in 1987, 25 year old Wendy Nell, she's a happy, independent, very successful young woman. She's got a whole life ahead of her. She's 25 years of age, right? So literally right at the very beginning, of her independence. She's a manageress at Super Snaps in Camden Rose. For those of you who don't know what that is, back in the days when I was a whippersnapper of a child, we didn't have things such as iPhones and technology where we could just take a picture and then print it and so on and so forth. No, we had to rely on going into a shop with a film from a camera that were all separate and then we would hand it over, we'd have our pictures back. And usually those pictures would come back and there would be stickers when there had been overexposure, like over your face, saying this is overexposed, as if you didn't know that from the fact your face looked like it was on fire and also had a massive sticker on it to tell you that it was overexposed. That was how it was when I grew up. So she works at one of these shops and she's a manageress, so again, quite a responsible position. She was described by her family as very funny, she was hardworking, she was very trusted. And one of the big things about her was that she longed to have children. And she was at a point in her life at 25 where she planned to marry her long-term boyfriend, Ian Plass. So life was genuinely beginning. The 22nd of June, 1987, Ian drops Wendy off at her flat in Guildford Road, Tunbridge Wells. She's actually moved there after the failure of her first marriage. So she'd had some turbulence in her life. And in spite of the fact she started to build a new independence and a new life for herself, what she's unaware of is that during this period, she's being watched. In fact, somebody had been stalking her for a very long time. And the reason they'd done that is they were looking for what they considered the perfect victim. And indeed, this individual had identified her as an ideal victim. She was vulnerable, she was young, she lived alone in a ground floor studio flat. And at some point, an intruder entered her flat. It's still not actually known how, with respect. It is believed that there was potentially an unlocked window and Wendy's body was discovered by her boyfriend, Ian later on. She'd been brutally attacked. And 
when we look at killings, you know, we kind of form a picture of what was going on in the mind of that individual. Was it a home invasion gone wrong, etc.? Very rarely that that's the case. But when somebody is brutally attacked in the way where they're viciously beaten around their head with a blunt object, as was in this case, and then after that they're strangled to death, this killer absolutely, without a doubt, went with that intention. This wasn't something that had gone wrong. And the very fact that when the forensics looked at her body, there was an absence of any defence wounds, and also there was a really orderly nature to the flat, meaning that she hadn't been taken by surprise and fought. There hadn't been a struggle. And even because of the fact that she lived in a bedsit, you would have imagined that there had been some kind of noise, because obviously you imagine somebody being killed would cause a commotion. Actually, the neighbours heard absolutely nothing on the night of the attack. So it seems like she was in a situation where she was potentially asleep, which means that before she knew it, she had been violently beaten around the head, meaning that she couldn't fight back. When they did the post-mortem, it revealed that she'd also been sexually assaulted. So there was a sexual motive to this crime. And her attacker, well, he just left her naked body, lifeless, naked in bed. And they found semen in her mouth and in her vagina and non aduve They also found evidence of anal penetration. However, the authorities who investigated the case, they believed that the sexual assault happened after death. So post-mortem. And the blood analysis indicated that Wendy's body had actually been moved into different positions while she was bleeding profusely from her head wounds. So this is most likely because her attacker wanted to pose her in different sexual situations to assault her in different ways. But you can see that this person took time. And I think we always have to be very aware that when somebody takes time, there is a arrogance to the crime. There's a superiority, a belief that the individual is relatively untouchable, so that once their work is done, i.e. the killing, they can then gratify themselves in this way without fear of intrusion. Again, what does that say about the stalking level of this perpetrator? They knew her movements. They knew that they had time. Now, when the police were looking into this, as far as the forensics were concerned, remember, this is the 80s. The only clue that they actually were able to find that kind of tied the crime scene to a potential perpetrator was this distinctive footmark in the blood on the cuff of Wendy's blouse, which had been left by the killer. We often hear in cases when people have unusual footprints that are left at scenes, that the police are constantly looking for people who wear a particular type of trainer or have bought specific ones that are quite rare so that then they can look at who those individuals are and trace them back. And that was important that they kind of kept that information because of course, if the case goes cold, it means that at some point in the future, if they find somebody retrospectively, they have these kind of evidence bases where they can connect those threads together. Now bear in mind, this is an innocent 25 year old woman who'd been living on her own, about to start the rest of her life. It's gonna have a massive impact on the local community, and it did. They were absolutely blindsided. There'd been this violent crime, and the fact that it could happen there in a studio flat with flimsy walls, these are all the things that essentially should draw attention if somebody's being attacked. But this individual had managed to carry out this murder, this heinous, violent, gratuitous murder, very much under the nose of many people around her. Now, worse is to come to some degree, and I know that we can argue, well, how can it ever get worse than one individual getting murdered? Well, of course not for that family and for that individual. The life ends there and it's horrific and heinous and reprehensible. But later that same year, well, another woman, she loses her life in very similar circumstances. Like Wendy, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce, well, she also lived alone in a basement flat in Grosvenor Park. She's really happy, she's a very lively young woman, and she's a manager at Buster Brown's, which is an American restaurant, and that's also in Camden Road. So again, we're seeing a very small geographical area. That's just a quarter of a mile from where Wendy worked. Caroline was evidently aware, however, of her own vulnerability because she had recently had her locks repaired. I just want you to think about that psychologically. The fact that Caroline had heard about this murder, 
that another young woman a similar age in a similar location had found herself gruesomely murdered in this way. She'd obviously recognised that she needed to be very aware of her own safety. So she'd had the window locks repaired. And it also makes me think, did she have some suspicions at the time that there was an individual who was tracking her? Because sometimes we get those feelings, don't we? We might see somebody turning up in an area more regular than you think it would be coincidence-wise. Could it be that she was thinking that there was somebody who was following her? Did she have a suspicion that maybe there was somebody like a peeping Tom around? But for whatever reason, she'd taken that now and she thought, I'm going to do something to protect myself. And that makes me feel really, really sad that here we have somebody trying her best to protect herself and still it fails. Because on the 24th of November, 1987, Caroline had spent the day with friends and she returned home by taxi. So again, let me draw your attention to the fact we have a very diligent young woman here. She's clearly concerned about her safety. What do serial killers tell us about why they select a victim? Vulnerability, availability, desirability. Now, Caroline, cannot help being desirable to her killer, she can't be. But availability and vulnerability were there to some degree in her control and she is controlling them. She's taking measures to protect her home by having window locks fitted and she's also returning home by taxi. So she's cutting down the availability and vulnerability level there and that's really important to note. Now in spite of the fact that she gets this taxi home, she was never seen alive again. Neighbours did report hearing screams from an area around her flat. And it's actually unclear at this point whether Caroline ever made it to her flat physically because there was no one to corroborate, no witnesses to say, yes, she actually got into the home, but essentially she vanished. And that vanishing went on for nearly a month because only on the 15th of December was her naked body found and it was found by a farm worker nearly 40 miles away from her flat. It's in a remote location. It was in a water-filled dike on the Romney marshes. And the only reason that she was ever brought home, I suppose, is that a tractor driver spotted her. And the reason that he spotted her was because he had this very high position in his vehicle cab, essentially. And that's what draws his attention to the fact that he thinks he's seen a body. She was naked, aside from her tights. So again, we're drawn into this understanding that it would have been a sexually motivated attack. And as with Wendy, same MO. Caroline had been beaten around the head with a blunt object. She'd then been strangled. She'd also been sexually assaulted. Due to the decomposition, as you will imagine, you know, the body had been left in water for a period of time, it then gets quite difficult to establish forensically what had actually been done to her. However, what they did manage to find was that there was semen on her tights. So again, they can see that in spite of there's been decomposition and obviously the body's not in a good state, they've still managed to recover this evidence. And albeit at this point in time, it isn't that useful. It means that it's something that can be put in storage, doesn't it? Now the killings notoriously became known as the bed sit murders due to the fact that both victims lived alone in flats and the police from the get go absolutely convinced these murders are linked. You can imagine how it would have been in the local area. Residents were terrified, they were on high alert, they were constantly concerned, and that happened to be a massive increase at that point of police presence in the area. And that's back in the day, I don't know whether a lot of you remember it, but in the UK, we used to have bobbies on the beach a lot, and there would literally be police officers that would just walk the streets near you. And one, it made you feel safe, I'm not saying that one solitary police officer can really do anything if crimes are going on behind closed doors, but for some reason it does kind of make you feel like the world is a safer place when you see a police officer walking up and down your street. It doesn't happen as much anymore because government funding's been massively cut. That seems good when crimes are going up, but who am I to throw any of the aspersions against the government? But nonetheless, it did make people feel pleased, but also if you are somebody who's an opportunist killer and no matter how much you stalk somebody or trawl somebody, lock in on them and want to harm them, you're also going to be very aware about the potential of you being apprehended. You won't necessarily strike in areas where a police presence grows significantly because that can lead you to being arrested. So it probably would have had a positive impact on the potential of a killer going and carrying out a murder in that same area again, just because it's made more difficult. And the police 
were very clear that there were fears that there was a serial killer on the loose. Remember what we say about serial killers? To be a serial killer, you need to kill two or more people. And the significant issue is you require a cooling off period in between. Why? Because that indicates that you are somebody who wishes to kill again. It wasn't a spur of the moment decision that's regretful. There's been a period of time to reflect, to recalibrate, to recalculate the impact and potential of what you did and either to give yourself up or certainly to stop that kind of behavior. If you strike again, well, there is a significantly higher chance of you doing it again and again and again. Now, the other thing we have to be aware of about these two crimes is the person who carried them out, well, they didn't just kill them. They spent a relatively large amount of time when you consider what most perpetrators of crimes want to do, which is to carry out a crime and leave the scene because you don't want to get caught. Well, this individual was different. They spent quite a long time with the body, satisfying some very warped sexual desires. And let us be very clear, on the spectrum of what is the most depraved kind of sexual behavior you could ever anticipate anybody considering something that they would like to do, necrophilia is at the very top of the, I need to see a psychiatrist immediately list, genuinely. Because if you wanna have sex with a dead body, you literally want to avoid having a relationship all too together. This is about possession, ownership, and satisfying one's own needs without care, consideration, or concern of the individual that you are intimately using. Simple as that. It's not just that you wanna go and have a quick one night stand with somebody you really don't give a crap about, might not even be attracted to, but you just want something to use. I mean, that's not really a nice psyche, is it? It's not, using people isn't nice, but at least in that context, you are actually going home with somebody and having some kind of intimacy with them, albeit fleeting. Hopefully you're trying to satisfy their needs whilst you're satisfying your own. When it's necrophilia, it is devoid of any relationship whatsoever, aside from with the self and your own sexual organs. So the authorities at this point are desperate. They want to find who this perpetrator is, and rightfully so. There is nothing more terrifying than a serial killer in our midst. They are also looking for somebody who's highly organized. And the reason for that is both of the women have been attacked as they arrived home. So this person knew what they were doing. Also seemed that they'd been specifically selected and observed. That was one of the things that the profile brought up. They genuinely felt that whoever killed them knew them to some degree, could have been very arm's length, but nonetheless, they were familiar to the perpetrator. Unfortunately, we're talking back in 1987, when I was just a tiny child with bad hair and forensic science was very much in its infancy. It was beginning and it would take another eight years for the National DNA Database to be created. But of course, the coppers who are involved in this case, the investigators, they're clever. They know it's coming. I mean, I think that a lot of cold cases, these individuals who were basically working without even computers for many, many years, they stored things that you and I would not believe because as an investigator, you're not just thinking about the here and now, you're thinking about what happens next. And most police officers have been through a journey of watching technology increase and improve within the years that they're in the service. So whenever they find things that might not be able to decipher a killer in this moment, well, they store it for a future moment. And certainly that's what they were doing. Now, unfortunately for both Wendy and Caroline, their murders went unsolved for decades, which is, horrific to imagine because you've got to think these women were related to families who loved them very very much now in 2008 2008 talking a long time afterwards the kent police well they form a cold case team and what their job is is to go and review unsolved murders if i was a police officer this is what i'd want to do I'd either want to work in paedophile cases because I have like the biggest disdain and my nature when it comes down to paedophiles is one where I feel absolutely compelled to do as much to talk about abuse and the impact of child survivors and so on and so forth because I find it just the most abhorrent state to abuse a child. So I'd either do that or I'd want to work on cold cases to bring families that peace and also to bring those 
individual criminals who got away with it for years to justice. That must be so satisfying. It must be so gratifying to know that you are the person who brings that person in bang to rights, finally. So in 2019, this is obviously years after the 2008 Kent Police have formed the cold case review team, following advancements in DNA science, they start reviewing the unsolved murders of Wendy and Caroline. This is 32 years since those girls, those young women have passed. Now on one level, this is horrific because the families of the victims have waited 32 years. I mean, the dreadful experience of just not knowing who has killed your children and also that this person is probably walking around, may have carried out more murders. There's no chance of any closure, is there, whilst that serial killer is still at large. So they start using these really amazing scientific techniques. New samples are collected from exhibits from Caroline's crime scene and they were found to match samples from Wendy's crime scene as the police had initially suspected. This was the first time a scientific link between the murders had been made. So even though it was suspected, it hadn't been directly connected. So police now know that they're looking for the same individual in connection with both murders, and that must have fueled the investigation massively. Imagine knowing that you were right, that those investigating officers were correct in their assumption this was a serial killer, and then you got that DNA profile connected, and now you must have an urgency. Because 32 years, what are the chances that that individual has satiated their desire for the kind of killings that they've carried out? Will they have, or will they have continued? They could be looking at a huge body count, couldn't they? So the urgency is going to be there in that moment. So now the police have a full DNA profile from this unknown suspect. Unfortunately, at this point, they put it through the DNA database and the individual isn't actually on the police national database. So that in itself makes you go, wow. This is somebody who's carried out two significant crimes where murder is involved and sexual assault or interfering with a corpse after murder. And yet they haven't cropped up as a criminal, at least not as far as the DNA database goes, it's not necessarily that he hasn't committed crimes, it's that they haven't got evidence of those crimes on the database. So it's not been at a point where he's been seen by the police since those crimes where DNA has been gathered. It must have been so frustrating. So then investigators are like, we're not giving this up. Not a chance. This is something that we need to find ASAP. So they turn to plan B. And how they do this and this is happening more and more and more now for any of you out there who, like me, may have sent your DNA off to someone like my heritage to get figured out where you come from. Well, obviously, that creates a familial DNA opportunity, doesn't it? And also, the police themselves can do that because if they've got DNA databases available to them, they can then put it through the familial DNA process and they can find potential relatives of the person that they're actually looking for because relatives obviously share similar DNA. At this point, they do manage to identify a list of about a thousand potential relatives. Now this is shortlisted to 90, but still there's a lot of people, isn't there? And they're flagging up, of, well, this could be a potential relative match. So that's a massive police undertaking and testament to the authorities that they're doing this. Because this is real diligence, isn't it? This is detective diligence at play. They wanna make sure that they find this person and they're gonna go through these individuals to create the opportunity to find that direct link. Amazingly as well, another 20 police forces actually assisted this constabulary across the country because they wanted to make sure that they brought this person to justice. So all 90 individuals that they flagged up need to be interviewed and then they need to have voluntary samples taken. Ultimately, during that experience of refining them down, one individual is identified as having a really closely matching DNA to that profile from the crime scene. And the person had a relative that fitted the suspect police were searching for. Now this relative, firstly, was in the same age group that they were looking for, and secondly, lived close to Tunbridge Wells. The individual in question was father of three, 65-year-old David Fuller. The familial DNA had belonged to his brother. 
Now, the likelihood of the crime scene DNA belonging to someone else was, wait for it, a billion to one. A billion to one. A billion to one. Billion. So they know that they've got their guy. Now, Fuller, he'd been born in the mid-1950s, and he'd trained as an electrician and maintenance man whilst working in the Navy shipyard of Portsmouth. He hadn't been on police radar, never been convicted of a violent crime. But that doesn't mean he wasn't a criminal, because when we start looking back through his history, well, he was a criminal, and he'd started his criminal life relatively early. First of all, it turned out he was in trouble at school for stealing bikes, and he was also known to damage properties in fires. Bear in mind what we're looking for in serial killers, pyromania, set in fires, is a big red flag. As is criminal behavior, we've got two of those there. Also, he was convicted of a string of creeper type domestic burglaries in the 1970s. Creeper type means often the person can be in the home whilst the victims are actually in the house. So really odd boundaries, somebody who's willing to do that. And also what's the gratification of knowing that you're in a powerful situation while somebody doesn't even know that you're in the home stealing from them. Also, when they looked at those crimes, it tended to involve him breaking in through the rear windows. So for me, well, he's perfecting the MO, isn't he? First of all, he's perfecting how he steals from people on an MO level, but his modus operandi and the killings he's practicing for as well. Because where Caroline and Wendy's murders were, that's how he got into the house. Back in the day when he was caught for these burglaries, he had pleaded guilty to them and he got charged with three domestic burglaries at Portsmouth Crown Court in 1973. During that as well, they took into consideration 23 other offences. That means that often you'll get tried for a certain amount, but then they'll kind of write off the others that are lesser. So he has that done as well. And then he also pleads guilty to a further offence in 1977, so that's four years later. And at that point, again, he wants three other offences taken into consideration, writing those off. But he's never jailed, which is gobsmacking for me. I mean, it's not low level, breaking into people's houses, creeping around, particularly if they're in the home, that's putting you and them at risk to some degree, and you're certainly the perpetrators, I've got no sympathy for you. But the fact that they don't apprehend him, where are the consequences? I think when we're looking at these cases, there's always that frustration when you kind of look at what the consequences were for these individuals. If you're caught doing pretty high level crimes and then you don't actually get put inside, you don't have a taste of what it's like to lose your freedom. If you don't get a taste of what it's like to lose your freedom, then to some degree, how on earth can you be in a situation where you understand that these kind of actions have terrible consequences for you and your freedom? That noted, it could be that after he was in a situation where he was in court and he was getting into trouble for these kind of petty offences, although I don't think they're that petty, was it that he thought, well, if I'm going to get into trouble for these things but not get massive sentences, and if I kind of feel I can outsmart the system, then I may as well, first of all, get a little bit more brave with the predilections I've got, and second of all, make sure I don't leave a witness after carrying out those predilections. Then I can evade capture and evade jail. This is something that I'm just playing with in my head, but certainly it's interesting to see that no consequences could have had an impact or the consequences being so lenient and leading him to think, oh, I don't ever want to get to a point where I am put in prison could also equally be problematic. So early hours of the 3rd of December, 2020, the police have got this information now, haven't they? So the police attended Fuller's home in Heathfield, that's in East Sussex. That's where he lives with his wife and his teenage son, I say that just to make a note. Can you imagine what that would be like? You're living with somebody that you love, you've got a kid with them, and the police turn up to arrest your partner because he's suspected of a double homicide. Your teenage child, how on earth do they make sense of that when you're their father? They are also victims in this, aren't they? So he's arrested at this point and they take a DNA sample it's been 36 hours. Police have absolutely connected the crime scene with the DNA match. That's a positive connection. Therefore, they know they've got their guy. So after three decades, it seems they've got the man. However, in spite of them firstly having a history 
when it comes down to his experience of crimes prior to this situation fitting the MO. And the fact that they had his DNA actually at the crime scene. Yes, his DNA literally at the crime scene. He's like, no, it wasn't me. Don't know anything about it. Absolutely know nothing about it. Even more so, follows up with this great bit of information that I fully believe is a piece de resistance when you're going to be a liar. He says, I don't know anything about these murders. Not in the accent, by the way. He's quite a light speaker, more of this. I don't know anything. I've got no involvement in the murders. And also, I don't know Tunbridge Wells at all. Even though it's the next door town to you, David, even though it's literally the town next, you can walk to it from where you live, even that, you've never been there. Anyway, that's what he says. And please also then start investigating Fuller. And to add insult to injury with this lie, because David Fuller is not a good liar, let me put it out there, they start investigating his electrical work that he'd been doing, and apparently he'd carried it out all over Tunbridge Wells. So now the police recognise that he is trying to dissuade them that he is in fact the killer, when actually they have lots of evidence pointing that all he's doing is just gratuitously lying. Another big red flag, pathological liars, psychopathic serial killers, they definitely fit that, don't they? So the families and Wendy and Caroline at this moment in time get informed that they've got the guy. They probably made peace with the fact that they never thought they were gonna ever get closure for the horrific crimes committed towards their loved ones. And they genuinely said they'd never thought because such a lot of time had passed that anybody would get arrested in connection with the murders. But the careful work of the scenes of crime officers and the scientists, and this is the interesting thing, isn't it? You know those people who gathered that crime scene together? You know those individuals who painstakingly and diligently, at a time when it was a much more difficult, in 1987 it was a much more difficult situation to diligently collaborate with the crime scene to a position where you could actually keep things in good nick so that you could go back to them and actually make sure that the right kind of person was caught for this crime, the perpetrator was brought to justice. To me, it's knowing that those individual forensic officers and those individuals looking at the investigation, they were almost like in a time travel situation, weren't they? They wouldn't have known it at the time, but that's what they were doing. They were bringing to justice in the past a person who would eventually be brought to justice in the future. And all that separates them is time. But you're looking at these decades, you know, some of those officers will have retired. Some of the forensics will have retired and yet their work is why officers were able to piece this jigsaw together. And the dog with a bone issue of just not letting it lie. Those two girls, deserving legacy, those two girls' lives deserving meaning. I just think it's really important that we acknowledge that because that was 1987. They preserved them so well that they could do this investigation. Now, as the investigation continues, police start to really tighten the net around Fuller. They find bloody fingerprint on the plastic millets bag, which is found behind Wendy's bed, and that matches Fuller's left forefinger. Also, as regards that bloody footprint I was talking about before, the one on Wendy's blouse, well, investigators actually worked with Clark's footwear archivist to identify the footprint. And they established it was from a sports trek trainer. It had the same distinctive trainer that Fuller had at the time of the crime, so he'd owned a pair. Police also were able to find photos from 1970s and 80s of Fuller wearing those actual trainers. So they're seeing that he fits perfectly this profile. Also, that's not enough, as if these police officers weren't doing enough to kind of make sure this individual was brought in. The police are able to establish that Fuller had actually regularly visited Romney Marsh in Kent. Now that's where Caroline's body was found. He was basically a keen cyclist. He went there with his cycling club. Interesting to note that his fellow cyclists used to describe him as friendly and helpful. A bit like BTK, isn't he? He was described that way as well. Ed Kemper was described that way by the police officers whose pub he used to go to. A lot of our serial killers are good at being friendly and helpful, though we all know 
it's just a guise. And also, they can be friendly and helpful, can't they? Because what we know about psychopathic serial killers is they're able to completely act normally around the general public, particularly if they're an organised serial killer. And that's because they don't actually do anything wrong. So they can be really friendly and helpful and brutally massacre somebody and just completely coexist in harmony with themselves because they don't have that empathy level. Also, he used to go bird spotting, who's a bit of an ornithologist. There you go. So, all I'm saying is sometimes it's worth checking out whether you trust those individuals who stay in sheds with binoculars might be practicing for a bit of other kind of stalking and spotting, might they? But anyway, they're drawing this picture up of him, and like I said, they now know that he's been to Romney Marsh in Kent, which is where Carolyn's body's been found. Also, Fuller had actually married for a third time in 1987. That was when he was 32. That was the actual year the murders took place. How horrific for his wife to know that that was the year that the actual murders took place. While she is celebrating their new life, he's ending to innocent women's. His wife actually lived in a staff house at Broomhill Bank School. That was a special educational school in Tunbridge Wells. And this property, it was located just a couple of miles from Wendy and Caroline's flats. Also, when I looked up research-wise around this particular crime, it was evidenced that around that area that I've just talked about, a lot of young women were complaining that there was a prowler. They complained that there was somebody spying through windows, somebody was entering their property when they were out, and it turned out that one such property had been Caroline's flat. So he'd been in there when she'd been out creeping around. It also transpired that he was very familiar with the street where Wendy had lived. So Fuller had previously lived just 100 yards away. So now the pieces of the jigsaw are really coming together and his lies have been completely outed. It's as simple as that. So the police, they are absolutely convinced, as we are at this point, that they've got the man. They believed that Fuller was a highly organised killer, a highly organised offender, the killings had been premeditated carefully. He'd planned and executed them carefully. And what he'd done was he'd identified a vulnerable victim. He'd then stalked them. And the police were assisted by the fact that Fuller actually kept obsessive records of his life. I mean obsessive. So I know I do this quite a lot with criminals, but there is nothing like the criminal mind to trip up the criminal. You know, if you are going to be an organised offender, then obviously the traits show that you might have an obsessive compulsive angle to your mentality and the way that you do things because you don't want to get apprehended. But when it comes down to noting down everything that you do, you are kind of admitting to your crimes and giving a chronologically detailed date time stamped plan of what you've done that you can just hand over to investigators. So no matter how organized and bright they are, they often have a part of themselves that is very, very stupid or so superior that they never think they're gonna get caught so they can just carry out this kind of behavior. So he's got all these obsessive recordings about what he's done. So the police on earth evidence indicating that Fuller had actually visited Wendy and Caroline at their places of work. So he'd actually got in there whilst he was stalking his victim. And these are perfect victims, aren't they? They're working. What can you do if some strange person comes in regularly? Or how do you know that somebody's strange if somebody just comes in and chats to you? Little do you know that they are fixated on you, that they are planning your execution. That was what was happening for Wendy and Caroline. This man was going in. Remember what I say when I'm talking about serial killers. Their fantasy is equally as important as their reality. They spend years at times just gestating on the idea and fantasy of what they're going to play out. That's what they want to do. So Caroline and Wendy, when they are alive, are equally a big part of his plan as when they are dead. Because they fuel the fantasy. He's drawing it out. Yes, he's stalking them, figuring out what their movements are, but this is all about the fantasy. Human beings are very unpredictable, so therefore the crime is never the perfect crime. 
That's why serial killers kill again and again and again. But it's the fact that if you can draw it out so that the feeling, the sexual gratification can lend itself to the longest stretched experience before the kill, then you enjoy the experience of fantasy more. He also had mentioned in these entries that he'd visited the Buster Brown's restaurant. Now that was where Caroline worked and he's put this in his diaries. Police also found photos in super snap sleeves where Wendy worked. So he was having his photographs developed in the very place where one of his victims worked. Who knows? They may have had a good relationship as a customer and a manager. It's so distressing to imagine that she was handing over photographs to her future killer. During questioning, of course, David feels like, no, nope, don't know who they are, nothing to do with it. Yeah, you've got all that stuff, but I don't know what you're talking about. Arrogance is huge. And also kind of lends us to this idea of, does he know he's banged to rights? Is he just recognizing it's a matter of time? Does he feel he's arrogant and superior enough so that if he denies it, enough people will believe him? Is he dealing with a disconnect where he's put so much distance between him and the crimes that he really isn't enabling himself to make the stretch to connect with what he did? Or is it that he feels a level of shame that he's been caught and he just doesn't want to acknowledge it? They're all potentials. I think we'll all probably go for the massively arrogant and superior who just thinks that somehow he's going to be able to talk his way out of these scenarios. When I've watched the interrogations of him, I do get a very discomforting feeling watching. It's like he's acting like this really mild, meek, mannered man. How could I possibly do that? Even when he's taking responsibility for certain things, you do feel that there's a disconnect. So the police have now got him. They're thinking, right, we need to find out as much as we can to build a profile for the prosecution. But wow. Wow. Guys, wow. What the police discover during the search of Fuller's home revealed the true horror of his nature. And horror it was. So Fuller had worked for years in hospitals. So in November 1988, this is a year after the murders, he gets a job in the maintenance department of Kent and Sussex Hospital. His job there was to work as an electrical maintenance contractor. He also managed to dodge criminal records checks at the time because it was the employee's responsibility to disclose any past crimes. I know, just go through that again, just for those of you who aren't quite listening as you should be. You know, we have those moments making a cup of tea, the kids are screaming and so on and so forth. But just let me take you through that sentence again. It was the employee's responsibility to disclose any past crimes to get a job. So, you know, if you've murdered a few people, done a few armed robberies, been categorised as a paedophile, been banged to rights of beating your crap out of your partner, apparently didn't need to disclose that unless you wanted to. So you, as the employee, with a person who had to somehow show this great stretch of honesty by going, yeah, I have got a criminal record and I'm really sorry for that. How many criminals are going to be like, I'm going to do that? And don't get me wrong, for good reason, on one level, a lot of low-level criminals who are trying to get their lives together, when they go for a job and then they have to say that they were a shoplifter or they committed fraud, the job's probably not going to be given to them. And that's very limiting, so I get that people would lie about that. But with respect, when it comes down to the fact that you're dealing with rapists and murderers and paedophiles, why are they going to say, yes, I definitely went ahead and disclosed to my employer because I wanted to be an honest little rabbit? You're just going to absolutely lie. And that's what he does. He lies and says, I don't have any previous convictions. So he gets the job. Doesn't disclose this string of burglaries that he's been involved in because that clearly makes him seem very untrustworthy. And he actually gets promoted. So he gets promoted to a maintenance supervisor and he works there until May 2011. Then he gets employed as an estate supervisor at Pembury Hospital in Tunbridge Wells. Tunbridge Wells, you know the place where he said he didn't even know it existed, next town to him, where he used to do electrical jobs. Yeah, gets a job as a supervisor at Pembury Hospital there, but didn't remember that whilst he was being interrogated. Hmm. So the nature of Fuller's job role, bear in mind now he's quite in charge, it means he's got an access to basically areas of the hospital that were usually out of bounds to other people. He had an employee swipe card and that meant that he could access all areas, including the mortuaries. So 
in the mortuary and in the hospital, there are differing areas where CCTV is concerned. So hospital areas obviously have a great deal of CCTV to protect both the staff and the patients. But the mortuary in the area where the post-mortems are carried out, they don't have CCTV. And this wasn't an oversight. This was a choice and it was a choice for the right reason. It was to preserve the dignity of the patients. And I think that's really important to note because often we can look back and say, well, why didn't they have CCTV? You know, this man would have been discovered if that had been the case. Well, it was genuinely because they wanted to make sure that those people who were being operated on in a way that very few of us would wish to be operated on to confirm why somebody had died, didn't have the indignity of being recorded and being looked at by others in that moment. Now, Fuller would basically wait until the mortuary staff had left before he would enter. The mortuary had five members of staff and they would work from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. Fuller, he generally worked from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., which gave him a three-hour window alone. Now, David Fuller knew that there was absolutely no way that anybody would enter the post-mortem room out of working hours. So that was one thing. He had a three-hour window. Also, he would carry his maintenance equipment with him in case he needed to justify why he was there. And think about it, how many people are gonna ask somebody why they're in a mortuary if they've got a bag of maintenance equipment and they're known as a member of staff? You're just gonna assume something needs fixing. But he had this so he could justify it. There were cameras on the corridors leading to the mortuary and there were also swipe card system logs. But no checks were ever made to actually establish if any staff members were making an unusual number of visits to the mortuary. I don't imagine that you would have reason to because people's psychology would usually not stretch to the position where they think that a member of staff is going into the mortuary to do abusive things. So it wasn't necessarily flagged up. I imagine it would be today, but at the time it wasn't. Now investigators looked at those logs and they analysed 150,000 hours of hospital CCTV. That's right, 150,000 hours of hospital CCTV and swipe card data to actually track Fuller's movements. It was established that he had entered the mortuary thousands of times, thousands. And however, when they looked at those thousands of times, always appeared to be carrying his equipment or he'd look like he was performing maintenance tasks. So he had a very good cover up and cover story for why he was there. But again, if they looked at those logs, it would have flagged, my God, what on earth is this person doing in the mortuary constantly? Even then, with respect, most people would just be like, okay, maybe he just does system checks. Maybe there is a reason for that. It's kind of how we work in our life we trust the people around us. And I imagine that people who knew Fuller trusted him, like his cycling mates and bird watching mates trusted him because he seemed to be normal. Now what Fuller did alone in that mortuary is a stuff of nightmares. It really is. Because when they searched his home, it revealed the most unbelievable stuff, it really did. Incredible amount of explicit materials. It indicated that he had been sexually abusing the corpses of girls and women whilst they were in that mortuary. I know that they were dead, guys, but I don't think you can ever be more vulnerable than when your body is exposed that way. This is in your most vulnerable of moments. It's the time that you, know, you have left your body as far as you being conscious and consciousness being present, but that is your body. And your body has been entrusted to these individuals to do what is right, to protect you when you can no longer protect yourself. And he had been sexually abusing the corpses of those girls and women. The investigators were able to connect Fuller to at least 102 female cadavers between 2008 and 2020. At least 102. So 102 bodies had been violated by Fuller in that time. The youngest of which was nine years of age. The oldest of which was 100. So he was just rampant 
in that place. In abusing that nine-year-old baby, that nine-year-old girl, Fuller would have had to have removed her clothes, her toys, and a letter that her grieving mother had left her with. So he'd have had to have removed all of those before he abused her body. Her mother would later describe that little girl as the kindest and bravest person that she'd ever met. She said she laughed, she loved like no other, and she was so grateful for life. That same mother would later face Fuller in court. And this is what she told him. You raped my baby. To me, this is rape in the most unimaginable way. She couldn't say no to this dirty man who abused her body. It makes my skin crawl. It really does break my heart. Rightfully so. And I agree that was rape. A nine-year-old little girl who lost her life. And that man took time to remove all the things of meaning to that baby, to that little girl, and then had pleasure with her body. No wonder it broke that woman's heart. She trusted that child to the services, hoping that they would offer her the same protection that she had in her life. In fact, three of the identified victims of abuse were under 18. Two of his victims had actually been sisters. Sisters who died in a car crash along with their father. I just want you to think about that for a second. We are talking about a mother's family wiped out. Father, two daughters killed in an instant. 16 year old Mary Akande and 22 year old Helen, both of them subjected to heinous abuse at the hands of Fuller. Imagine being Nikkei, the mother, having this new information that her daughters who died in that crash had been horribly abused by this man. She had to deal with that. She was the sole survivor of that crash, by the way. So she'd not just lived through the horrific trauma of losing her family, her entire family being wiped out. She then had to know that those children that she loved and grieved had had those final moments with that predator. I imagine the wounds would have been so opened and also the survivor guilt, because we don't talk about that a great deal, but survivor guilt is horrific. For survivors of situations where your whole family gets wiped out, you lose a child in an accident, you're constantly thinking, why not me? And part of you is so angry because you just wish it was you and if you could just change your place with them in a heartbeat, my God, you would in the blink of an eye. And she had to relive all of that. And again, probably feel guilt about the fact that she couldn't protect her daughters from that horrendous monster. Now, another victim was 24-year-old Azra Kamal. She actually died following a fall from a bridge in July 2020. I mean, imagine being her mother anyway. To lose a child that way is just horrific, particularly a 24-year-old at the beginning of her life for whatever reasons that that death occurred. The point is her poor mother is dealing with the outrageous grief that's created by that. Apparently, the first incidents of abuse literally occurred just hours after her mother had visited her daughter to stroke her head and to say goodbye. Her mother, who by the way, if you watch an interview with her, is incredibly dignified with a rage that you can hear. It's a very quiet rage, but my God, it's there. That poor woman, all you feel when you listen to her words is just this deep empathy and this knowledge that the one thing that no one has a right to take from you are those final moments that you have with your child and yet David Fuller just felt entitled to it. She said this, I'd spent two hours in the mortuary sleeping with her and that gave me some sort of comfort. Little did I know that my daughter had been violated prior to that day and the evening of that day. So while I'm stroking my daughter's hair, sleeping on her hair, a man had crawled all over her skin and there's me kissing and cuddling and saying my last goodbyes. I mean, that human insight tells us everything, doesn't it? And that's what he did. That's what he was stealing. After learning of Fuller's attack on her late daughter, 
She actually went to the police station where he was being held and she had a kitchen knife with her. All I feel for that woman is respect. I know we can't be vigilantes. I appreciate that there's law and order. I also know that there are very few things that can breach a desire to maintain law and order than the loss of a child in such a way. I think that there are bridges that most of us can cross in moments of such misery. And I think she did that. She actually said this, if I found him, I'm 99.99% .99 sure I'd have put that knife straight through his heart because he put a knife through mine. The thought of him violating her, of touching her hair, touching her skin. However, fortunately, with respect, as she approached the police station, all hell broke loose. About eight or nine police officers appeared. They threw her to the ground, they handcuffed her, and they actually kept her in a cell for 34 hours for her own protection. Once the police realised the circumstances, they were so much more sympathetic. And the female officer who took her fingerprints was actually in tears. So again, the police did what they had to do. They did. We can't have people going into a police station with a knife because that might not be to kill the person who's the said criminal. It may be that actually they're going in to harm a member of the public or a police officer. And of course, you just can't go around willy-nilly stabbing people. But the empathy that was then shown when they realised what she was reacting to, it's worth noting because when they realised, they really did understand that this came from a place of maternal love and a desperation to avenge the behaviour that this monster had bestowed on her much loved and much lost child because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a much loved and a much lost child. So the police establish as well that one of the things that Fuller did in his recordings, remember he was very diligent in his diary entries and his recordings, but what they found out is that he'd taken photographs and video footage of him abusing the corpses. So he's filming this. Again, the arrogance, the superiority complex, this man who feels like he's not gonna get caught. So he's got time, he's taking video cameras in, he's setting this up, this is an industry for him. So after he abuses the corpses, he then transfers the video footage to hard drives and then he hides them. What do we see there? We see straight away this man knows that what he is doing is criminal and so reprehensible that if anybody found these images or this video footage, he would be in serious trouble. So he's hiding them. So he knows that it's immoral, he knows it's illegal, and he knows it would impact and impinge on his freedom should they be found. The police also were able to match the swipe card data and CCTV footage of Fuller entering the mortuary with the dates and times of the abuse videos. So this helps them. It means that they're able to firstly understand his movements, but also identify his victims. So they actually find these four portable hard drives hidden in a box screwed to the rear of a chest of drawers in his wardrobe. So he's gone to great lengths to make sure nobody finds them. On one hard drive alone, it contained over 800,000 images and 504 videos. Just let that sink in. 800,000 images and 504 videos. This is a full-time job for this man. This kind of predilection is his full life. Another one they found well, had hundreds of images of raped and murdered women and girls downloaded from the internet because that shit is on there. I don't know how when Facebook and Twitter can stop the person who created the technology that's in the vaccines, Robert Malone, from being allowed to tell the truth online that this kind of stuff gets taken down. But... 504 videos of people being horribly abused and millions of pictures of raped and murdered women just being downloaded from the internet. That can all just stay. I don't get it. I don't get it. If we're going to censor, can we please start censoring this shit? Can we stop people being violated vicariously through cyber crime? Can we do that, please? Can we put our energies into doing something that saves babies, children, women being horribly murdered, mutilated, raped and abused. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. Sorry, I know I went a bit political then, but I don't care. I don't care, this is ridiculous. This guy had 800,000 images. 
Get a hard drive full of women being raped and murdered. Also, they found explicit images of him carrying out abuse in his office and wardrobe printed from hard drives. So he was literally carrying out abuse himself and videoing it and actually sharing that probably. What investigators also saw within this was just a range of sickening abuse. So it wasn't just one particular predilection and they're like, right, this guy is into necrophilia. It wasn't. He liked serious abuse of a range of victims. So if you're dealing with that as an officer, you're seeing things that you would never wish to see, but also the range is so prolific. You're being introduced to just the worst of society, the worst predilections you could ever imagine. The aversion that you must feel looking at pictures that no one should see must be quite catastrophic. And I imagine a lot of officers suffer from PTSD because of it. So this sickening footage and images show Fuller with his penis, in the mouths, anuses, and vaginas of corpses. They show him penetrating their bodies with his fingers and tongues. And if that's not bad enough that they've got this footage anyway, it also lends them insight into the fact that he would pick particular corpses that he'd then repeatedly abuse over the course of up to several days. Many of them were abused before and after postmortems. Some even had marks because they'd killed themselves. So there were still marks on their bodies from that. Others still have medical equipment attached to their bodies. It is horrific to imagine that anybody could find this sexually provocative and let alone find it provocative, but then transmute that provocation in their mind into an actual action and to abuse bodies that way. When you look at his MO as well, he seemed to follow a particular MO. This applied both to his vulnerable living and of course, vulnerable deceased victims. So he identifies them, he stalks them. That was with his live victims. For example, he learned their movements. And then with regard to his dead victims, well, he went out of his way to find out literally any details he could about them. He'd even go on their social media pages. During the police interview, he was asked about that and he did admit to using Facebook to search for photos of the people he abused in the mortuary. Also, as with his live victims, he seemed to like posing his victims in certain positions that he could abuse them with. And he did that with the bodies, didn't he? With the live bodies, he would get their corpses and then he would take them and position them in a place that was most sexually gratifying for him. He did the same with the corpses. He'd remove them from the fridges and the body bags and then he'd abuse them on the floor in various positions. On one occasion, he even attached a TENS machine, that's the electrical impulse machine, to the dead body or to himself and his genitals. So he'd do it to their genitals or his genitals. And whether that was to create some stimulation for himself or whether it was just because again, he's so devoid of any understanding of what intimate relationships are like that he's actually titillated by the idea of stimulating their genitals, even though there would be no feeling or gratification for the individual who's now deceased experiencing it. Nonetheless, to me, it's probably just a sex toy for him and just another addition to his toolbox of depravity. Again, what we're talking about with respect is that he's highly organized because he knows what he's doing, how he's gonna do it and why he's doing it. And he wants to preserve the opportunities that he has to trigger the responses that he feels when he reflects on the crimes he's carried out. So he obsessively preserved the images and the footage of the abuse. That's one thing. He makes damn sure that he's got the images of what he's carried out. He methodically catalogued and indexed his collection. I know of some, shall we say, mass genocidal maniacs who did that, like to catalog the collection of crimes, like to keep records of the individuals that they snuffed out seems to be in the megalomaniac, psychopathic, sociopath, killer type traits, I think. Also, one of the things that he'd do, he's, he'd copy the mortuary logbook, which detailed the names and ages of the bodies. So he's not only recording it, he's literally identifying the person that he was abusing. And he actually kept some of those details on hard drives, some in folders, and then the rest he had in a black notebook, one of which was utterly sickeningly titled 
best yet. See what I said about fantasy? The fact that he's written best yet, it gives us an insight, doesn't it? And that insight is that he's constantly growing his particular fantasy. So he's building and building. He's looking for that perfect moment, that perfect fantasy connection. So best yet shows that there is an incremental shift in what his expectations are and his achievements within those expectations. Now he would catalog these particular things according to the type of attack that he'd carried out on the corpses. Ugh. You won't be surprised when I tell you that his necrophiliac attacks are believed to be the most extensive offending of their kind in British legal history. Because number one, necrophilia is rare, but number two, necrophilia on this level, it literally is unheard of. Now, if it couldn't get any worse, which is almost impossible to say a statement like this after outlining what I've told you, because right now we should be right at the bottom of what could potentially be an example of the most depraved, screwed up, terrifying, psychopathic serial killer ever. Well, there's more. Because as well as being a murderer and a necrophile, Fuller was clearly a paedophile as well. Yeah. So in addition to abusing the bodies of the young girls in the mortuary, police were able to also recover thousands, thousands of explicit images of children. Many of those were category A. So category A is really, really the most serious. Category A, when they are noting what level these pictures and images are, basically shows penetration of children by adults. So it's the worst of the worst. And one of the images they recovered showed a child of about three years of age being orally raped. He had a short video of a child around six being vaginally raped. Imagine that six, six. Others were category B. That was one where there was a little child being laid down whilst a man masturbated over her. There were some of the category C ones, which was a little girl showing her genitalia. But nonetheless, we have all those categories, some being the most of it, all being disgusting, all meaning that as far as I'm concerned, that individual should never ever walk the streets again. I cannot get my head around when they let people with these kind of horrific content on their hard drives not go to prison, but then I'm not the one making the rules. I also appreciate, guys, that when we're talking about paedophiles, there are a spectrum, and a paedophile may never act as a child molester, and a paedophile might end up being not only a child molester, but a horrible child molester and killer. There is a massive spectrum, some of which can be helped, some who can't be. But nonetheless, for me, it doesn't bode well if we're just letting people who download this kind of disgusting material and abuse children vicariously just allow them to carry on their lives. For me, it's really scary. There needs to be some kind of really serious intervention. But this is the kind of material that he's got. And it was actually one of the biggest stashes of child sexual abuse images ever discovered by police, ever. Just, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of this case before. I hope that you are kind of learning some extra facts about this. This man wasn't just the biggest necrophile that the police had ever discovered, probably in history. This man had the largest collection of child sexual abuse images ever discovered by police. This man lived and breathed depravity sexually. Abuse, that was his life. Now in total, the police searches of Fuller's home uncovered around four million images of sexual abuse. Four million. Many of those were downloaded online, but many were fuller abusing corpses. So there were just numerous ones of him doing that. Plus they also had around 1 million videos that he downloaded. Think about that. 4 million images, 1 million videos. How much time was devoted? Police were also able to find a pen camera in his home that was in one of his jackets. So a pen camera is, as you would imagine, it's a camera in a pen that's disguised. And it turned out that he'd actually secretly filmed his wife's relatives when she'd stayed at their house. I mean, what an invasion of trust. He'd hidden it in a bathroom. He'd filmed this relative undressing, showering, even using the toilet. 
He'd even accessed her computer and stolen images of her, which he then photoshopped her head onto images of corpses he'd abused. How harrowing would that be for the relative? You, know, you just turn up, you just seeing your relatives, getting on with them, having a bit of a laugh, eating your meals together, and without you being aware, this absolute freak of a human being, this predator is filming you, but not only filming you, then using that footage and using pictures of you that he's stolen to have sexual fantasies about you. Like putting your head on the corpses of individuals he's abusing. How to give yourself nightmares. Ugh. Also, what does that say about his predilection for harm? We know what he's done before. He's stalked people. He's killed people. So if you're in his frame of reference, that is not a safe position to be in. Now, when questioned by police, Fuller basically completely denies Wendy's and Caroline's murders, as I've said, and continues to do that. But what he does give them is he admits to sexually abusing multiple dead bodies at hospitals that he worked at. Mm. When we think about this, we could go, right, David Fuller's admitted to the abusing of corpses, so is he telling the truth there and telling the truth about the fact that he wasn't really the person who murdered those girls? You know, he's told the truth about the fact that he's abused all these corpses. Nah, not really. What happened was the police had him on film doing it with a multiple of records recorded that meant that it was impossible. He was caught bang to rights, nothing he could do about it, right? So that in itself meant that there was nothing they could do about it. So even though he's given the police the fact that he was the person abusing multiple dead bodies at the hospital, he didn't really have a choice, did he? I mean, when there's video footage of you literally doing it, when there's loads of images of you literally doing it, when you've got a little back catalogue of said recordings noted down and entries literally saying which corpse you had abused with pictures of them on social media, I think it's going to be a difficult one for the defence to argue you weren't the person there. So even though he's admitting it, it's because there's no other option. And you see this with criminals as well. You see criminals often give a little hoping that somehow that will accommodate the fact that they believe that when you're denying other things that you're somehow telling the truth. And you're like, that never works. If you've admitted that you're a criminal, in this case, a disgusting paedophile and necrophile, then the chances of the police going, ah, oh, but he said he didn't kill those two women. We should probably definitely believe him because he told us the truth about this. That's never gonna happen, ever. Just saying, if you are the kind of person who's doing that and you stumbled across this video, it won't work, it won't work. Anyway, the police have got him. It's as simple as that. He claimed when he was questioned, and this is mind boggling and mind blowing, that he didn't actually do it for sexual gratification. Is it just me? Is it just me, David, that thinks that's a load of bollocks? Yeah, I just uh, sexually abused these corpses for years, recorded them all, catalogued them all, have some of the most violent pornographic material as well at home, paedophilia, etc. But no, it's nothing to do with sexual gratification. Clearly, a massive lie, David Fuller, massive liar. Because in some of the videos, if it wasn't enough, because arguably somebody could say, well, Emma, you know, Maybe it wasn't sexual. Yes, it was, because he ejaculates in some of the videos. It was purely sexual. It was purely dominance. It was purely about gratifying his needs. And I think the reason that he would have actually said this wasn't for sexual gratification is because he just wanted to minimise his actions. It's as simple as that. It took nine officers five months to work through that evidence. They had 100 hard drives equivalent of 23 terabytes of material, 1,300 CDs, 2,200 floppy disks, 30 mobile phones, 34,000 photo prints, negatives, slides, and camera film rolls. Of the 102 victims sexually abused by Fuller, around 80 were identified, many by pausing the videos Fuller had filmed, which allowed the investigators to basically read the wristbands on some of the bodies. It required a huge operation to then trace and sadly notify the families of these people. 
Of those involved, there were 166 family liaison officers, 27 police forces, 320 staff a day over five days. So a huge investigation. Now, Fuller's abuse of the dead bodies at the hospital were obviously further evidence of his involvement in Wendy and Caroline's murders because it showed that he had deep-seated necromania, which is exhibited in necrophilia. It was suggested, as suspected, that the murders were sexually motivated. He had basically killed them so he could then sexually abuse them after their death. Throughout the investigation, Fuller showed loads of remorse. He acknowledged that what he'd done was horrific. He made it clear to everybody that he was a reprehensible monster who deserved to be... No, he didn't. Absolutely did none of that. Of course he didn't. We know the MO of these individuals has no compassion, no empathy, no remorse whatsoever. The only thing that he displayed, self-pity. For our egomaniac narcissists, it's regularly shown, isn't it, that the only thing that they can feel is, I'm really feeling sorry for myself because I got caught for all these reprehensible crimes. That's what I imagine their internal dialogue is like. So he only cares about himself. He really is a reprehensible example of what can go wrong in a human form. Because even though he looks like one, his actions certainly don't depict that he is actually a human being at all. He's a monster, it's as simple as that. Now, when it gets to court, it happens at Maidstone Crown Court, 1st of November 2021, guys, 2021, so we're talking a few months ago. So having admitted sexual offences relating to the abuse of dead bodies, Fuller then faced two charges of murder, which is still denied. I'm just gonna keep denying it. You've got loads of evidence, clearly indicates it's me. Absolutely, bang to rights as far as that's concerned, but uh, it's gonna keep going. So he just still says he's not guilty at this point, And even though there's all this overwhelming evidence, he just keeps going with it. Now the prosecution referred to Fuller's depraved sexual predilections. And this is what they said. His desire for sexual gratification through the observation and identification of vulnerable women, gaining control of them, and then indulging his depraved sexual predilections in relation to them all provides the explanation in relation to their murder. It follows that he is responsible for the killing of these young women and then sexually assaulting their bodies after their deaths. I think we can all agree. It's a bloody good thing the prosecution said there and absolutely accurate. So, of course, we all know at the very beginning he goes not guilty. However, on the fourth day of the trial, he changes his plea to guilty. Evidently, finally realises he's a bank to rights and has no defence. Yes, I think so. I think just that paragraph, David Fuller, would have been enough to make me go, I'm not going to get away with this, am I? I'm just going to have to say I'm totally guilty. Now, this is a really difficult task, by the way, for Judge Mrs Justice Chima Grubb when it comes to sentencing, because Fuller has a total of 53 charges, many of them are historical. So ultimately, they impose a total of 12 years for the abuse of the corpses at hospitals and possession of prohibited images and videos. I think that's a really light sentence, genuinely, I do, but nonetheless, I'm sure that the judge really wasn't that concerned because they knew what they were gonna impart on him regarding the murders. So I think that even though they gave 12 years, that I think the bodies being abused in that way and the horrible images of children, etc., if that had maybe been in a scenario where he'd just been tried for that, he might have got a longer sentence, but I don't think that would have been the main concern. I think that was just letting the families of those abused by him know that they believed the actions were reprehensible and were deserving of a custodial sentence. But because the judge knew that she could sentence him for the double murders, I imagine that that was where her energy was going. And what the judge stated was this, having killed two young women who were full of the promise of life, you became a vulture, picking your victims from among the dead within the hidden world of hospital mortuaries, which you were left free to inhabit simply because you had a swipe card. The depravity of what you did reveals that your conscience is seared, calloused over. The sentence I'm about to pass means you will spend every day of the rest of your life in prison. For Caroline and Wendy's murders, a judge imposed a full life term without the possibility of parole. Yes, 
like Rose West, Joanna Dennehy, individuals who are so terrifying that the idea of them ever being allowed on our streets again is categorically denied. He will take his last breath, rightly so, in prison. When she came to that conclusion, it was because she had some serious aggravating factors. So planning, premeditation of the murders, and the sexual and sadistic nature of the killings. You know, these were planned. They were carried out executions for sexual gratification. You cannot get more aggravating than that. These women were defenseless, helpless, taken in the most tragic of moments where they should have been safe near or in their own homes. Now, Fuller has to be one of the most horrific individuals to pass through the English criminal justice system. Simple as that. He's a sadomasochist with psychopathic traits, beyond a shadow of a doubt. He's a murderer, a necrophile, a paedophile. The burglaries that he committed were in his 20s and they began as voyeurism. But wow, did that voyeurism turn into something far more sinister. Thank God he was finally brought to justice because this means that he cannot at least harm anybody else. It's just really unfair that he was able to live over 30 years of his life just free to offend again and again when he should have been in prison for a double murder. And also, let's be honest, I think that every single one of us in our gut right now is thinking we're okay. He got caught for two. He got caught for two murders. Is it likely that he didn't commit more? Could it not be that actually he's been responsible for some of those murders that simply we don't know he committed? What we do know is that the police were able to establish that he had abused corpses at hospitals from 2008. Which means that if we're going to look at the time frame, well that means that there must be a 20 year gap in offending between 1987 murders and the 2008 offences. I mean it's highly unlikely that he had a 20 year gap and then started again in 2008 onwards. I mean, I would say it's not just unusual, it's impossible. So what other crimes did he commit? Following Fuller's conviction, his ex-wife, 65 year old Jill Palmer and his children were in absolute shock. Jill said they didn't know the monster who had carried out these crimes. And I imagine that that's true. These individuals who love these absolute, reprehensible, depraved humans rarely know that they have this capacity because these individuals are so able to act as if they are just going about their daily business. They can apparently love, have joy, have fun, and so on and so forth, and also murder and rape and kill and do the most horrendous of things behind these individuals that they are meant to love's backs. This happens all the time. She was quoted as saying, it's too horrific. I can't even take it in myself yet. It's not right on so many levels. It's just not right. My children can't talk about it. They're not in a good frame of mind. What came out has been a total shock. It's their father you're talking about. They didn't know the man. I didn't know the man. Just feel absolute sadness for her. And his current wife, 50 year old Marla Fuller, she told reporters that she wanted to start a new life. She was divorcing Fuller and she was still in their house. I bet she was. I bet she wanted it to be burnt to the ground if she had her options. You know, for families of loved ones whose bodies were abused by Fuller as well. I mean, imagine that. The memories of their mothers, sisters, aunts, daughters. They've just been tainted by his actions. They've just been left with this trauma the knowledge that they couldn't protect them from this man. During the sentencing, the judge actually stated, as regards these families, it has shaken their sense of being able to trust the world, trust hospitals, predict the respect and decency with which those who are vulnerable will be treated. They've been left in a dark place. They have bad days and less bad days. Some wish they'd never been told. Some have chosen not to tell their wider family of what they've learnt, to save them the pain. Keeping such a secret is a heavy burden. The shock of what you did has caused a kind of white noise, which is inescapable. So beautifully put, isn't it? A white noise, which is inescapable. I often say that 
about these kind of traumas. It's like tinnitus, isn't it? It's like traumatic loss. It's always there. Sometimes it's a whisper, sometimes it's a scream, but it's always there. And that white noise description is so accurate. For Wendy and Caroline's families, their lives have been blighted for years. Caroline's mother, Katrina Frost, she told of the 34 year long nightmare she endured. She said that began the minute she had to identify the badly damaged body of her daughter, her only daughter. And Wendy's mother, Pamela, well, ultimately she had to leave work following her daughter's death. It was said that she became very lonely. Also detrimentally affected her marriage from that point onwards, which happens a lot when a child is murdered. The parents really struggle. And following the trial, the family gave a statement. And this was it. Hopefully, we can now start to breathe and move past the pain and start to remember her as the beautiful, kind, generous, caring and funny girl she was, who had a smile and a kind word for everyone. In 2007, Wendy's father, Bill, had told reporters, one day, someone's gonna ring that door and say, we've caught him and there'll be a celebration. By God, there will be especially if he goes down for a very, very long time. It turns out he was right. Tragically, though, he never got to see his daughter's killer brought to justice. He died in 2017. It's such a shame that her father never got to see her killer brought to justice. Fortunately, we've all been able to do that. And again, it's testament to those investigators, to those police officers, to the diligence of those forces, making sure that their past selves made sure that their future selves could bring this perpetrator to justice. I do think that Fuller is probably responsible for many, many more crimes. I would imagine that the police are gonna do a great deal intelligence wise to try to figure out whether he has more information because there may be bodies out there that they can't forensically connect that he may be able to shed light on. The idea that he had a period of time a long period of time without killing, to me, just banks of the fact that he probably simply changed the way that he killed so that he made himself get away with it in the future. Also, we can note that it is possible for serial killers to find other ways of gratifying and satisfying themselves. And certainly what we could argue is that David Fuller realized that it was actually having sex with dead bodies, which was the actual thing that had the full predilection for. Therefore, the killing of somebody no longer became necessary because he was using the mortuary to satisfy by his needs. Also with the rise in the internet, particularly with rise of the dark web, that's given him access to lots of material that could sexually satisfy him. However, even though that arguably could be a reason why he didn't carry out more killings, let me draw you back to the attention of some of the material that he downloaded. It involved the rape and murder of women. So arguably, the raping and murdering of women was also titillating for him. And when you have a predator that likes the spectrum sexually where depravity is concerned, so from nine-year-old and three-year-olds and five-year-old children all the way to 100-year-old women, for example, we're again being given an insight to a man who's never sexually satisfied. So why would he simply draw the line at necrophilia? I think we'll probably find out that Fuller is responsible for other murders and subsequently will hopefully be charged for some of those in the future. Either way, whether that happens or otherwise, he's never gonna be on the streets. He's certainly an individual who would never be safe to be on the streets. He also reminds you of just how these predators can live in our midst, seemingly in relationships, seemingly living a good above board life whilst actually carrying out the most heinous of crimes amongst us. I hope you found that I've covered the case diligently. I hope you've learned some things that you didn't know. I appreciate you recommending me doing this case. It is one that I think is just so distressing and also reminds us of how many of us blindly trust our family members to individuals to take away and to look after in death because we feel that we should be able to and hopefully for the most part we can when cases like this occur it just reminds us to think about security and the actual services that provide those opportunities to also think about how they make their environments more secure i'm sure the hospitals will be doing that now 
Also, before I finish, a lot of people will, for some reason, differentiate between a corpse and a human body who's living. Personally, I can't do that. The fact that somebody is no longer conscious in their body should not mean that anybody committing a crime to that body is given a lesser sentence, in my opinion. Unless you consent to somebody having sex with you, unless you consent to somebody having their hands on you, then essentially whoever is doing that without right or reason is abusing you and it should be treated in exactly the same way as far as I'm concerned, that somebody raping a conscious human being would be treated. It's an absolute breach of trust, it's a violation. And whilst that human being is no longer present with us, that's their body. They deserve the same respect as somebody living. Just my opinion, some of you may think differently, but that's where I'm at. I totally agree with the parents who had to be told of those children being molested by that man when they were dead that they feel that violation is very real. And I second that. Let me know your thoughts. Give me a comment. Give me a like if you found this interesting. Subscribe. And also, just again, big shout out to Patreon for supporting my content creation and to everybody else who joins me and watches and lets me know what you're thinking. It really helps me. And thanks again for the highly traumatizing recommendation. I hope I've done it justice more than anything. I hope I've done those victims justice and those families justice because their story needs to be told. It needs to be told well and it needs to be told in respect of their victims, their family members, their loved ones who sadly didn't have an opportunity themselves to see that man, that monster brought you justice. Join me next time. Take care.